a frantic expression of grief. I began in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. All praise is due to Allah, who sees and hears all things, and Allah, whose plans cannot be frustrated and to whom everyone is accountable, who gives us life and free will to earn whatever good we can, and who gives the evildoers time to amass their sins and be ever more punished. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone here. And thank you for inviting me to speak to uh, all our guests here at the Ummah Conference. And it's a pleasure, as always, to share my perspective on these topics. And I always try to bring a practical point of view to what I have learned in Islam. Today, the title of my talk is We Are the Daughters of Zainab alayhi salam. But I want to change that because we are the children of Zainab alayhi salam, a mother of four sons, Ali, Aun, Muhammad, Abbas, and a daughter, Um Kulthum. And she loved her children dearly. And so we are her children as well, not just the sisters here today, but the brothers as well, because you know the great sacrifice she made for two beloved sons. I want to read a translation from the Holy Quran, two ayahs from the Quran, that I think exemplify her character. It says in Surah An-Nisa, ayah 135, O oh, ye who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even as against yourselves, or your parents, or your kin. And whether it be against rich or poor, for Allah can best protect both. Follow not the lusts of your hearts, lest you swerve and ye distort justice, or decline to do justice. Verily, Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. And in another ayah, in Surah number 4, 148, Allah loveth not that evil should be noised abroad in public speech, except where injustice hath been done. For Allah is he who heareth and knoweth all things. I'm going to read that again because I think there's an interesting point here. Allah loveth not that evil should be noised abroad in public speech, except where injustice has been done. So these ayahs really exemplify the actions of the noble granddaughter of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad And they're a powerful reminder for us today and particularly to the women of our communities, that Allah loves, Allah loves that you speak out against injustice, not to be silent when it's necessary. But he also says, he exhorts you to be positive at all other times. That's the distinction in that ayah that I think is important. Because when we look at her life, it was under very, very extreme circumstances that she was placed, that she spoke out, and was forced to defend the Ahlul Bayt and, the, and to bring awareness to the crimes that had happened, because a lot of misinformation was out there. And today we all face a lot of that misinformation and disinformation that is out in the public and in the media. In a book called The Victory of Truth, the life of Zainab bint Ali, the author Bill Grami says, after Karbala, no one was left that had the courage to stand up to tyranny, to speak the truth and submit to the consequences. She was declaring the truth, but she wasn't declaring herself. She wasn't out there to represent herself. He goes on to emphasize that it is partly through her that the prophetic legacy was rescued from being eclipsed by the ever-present shadows of kufr. Kufr, again, remembers the denial of truth or the covering of truth. Not just somebody who doesn't agree with you, but the active denial of truth. So let's have a little context for her life. Many of you know her biography, but let's repeat some things because I think it puts everything into perspective. What she faced and how she had such strength to endure and to be steadfast in her belief in Allah. Because many of the tribulations that we face in our life are pretty minor 
compared to the tremendous losses and suffering that she and her family faced. So if we can put things into perspective, then certainly we can go on in our lives with much more courage and much more faith. So when she was around the age of five, she had a dream. And in this dream, it was strange, it was terrible. There was a violent wind that was blowing, and it arose in the city, and it made the earth and the sky dark. And the little girl in the dream was tossed hither and thither, and then became stuck in the branches of a tree. Now, as she was between those branches of the tree in the dream, the tree itself was violently plucked from the earth, and she grabbed on to another branch, but it broke. And then she grabbed on to a smaller twig, like the branches, but they were also flimsy and they broke away. And she went falling with no support. Now when she woke up and she told this dream to the Holy Prophet, he said that he was the tree and the branches were her mother, Fatima, and her father, Ali, and the twigs were Hassan and Hussein, all of whom she lost in a succession throughout her life. The last of whom to lose was her beloved brother, Hussein, who was one of the only ones who would comfort her when she was an infant. If she was crying, she would gaze into his eyes and she would be comforted and would stop crying. So the love that she had for her brother was immense. And just looking at him made her deeply happy and satisfied. And to see him suffer, and to see him lose his life in the way she did, was very devastating. So when you think of the tragedy of Karbala, think of her as an infant, gazing with love at her beloved brother. And the whole experience takes on a new dimension completely. Now, when it came time for Karbala and the day of the battle, Imam Hussein was resting and he woke up as well from a dream. And he stood and he spoke to Zainab and he gave her advice to face what was coming, the tribulations, the injustices. He said, the blessings of Allah are upon you. Do not worry about the trouble these wretched people will cause. And with that, she was fortified again to face the challenges. The blessings of Allah are upon you. He's saying to her, you're going to see and experience things in this world that are going to be challenging. But the true reality is beyond this world. The true reality of who you are and what we're doing and the results of it will be evident at another time and place. You must have faith in the unseen. This is what this message is. But despite all of these heartbreaking losses and sufferings and difficulties, Zainab salam was many wonderful, uh, she had many wonderful attributes. And these are some of the names that were given to her. She was scholarly and fluent. She was beloved as a teacher to the women for the religious teachings that she gave. And for this, they called her Fasiha. She was intensely eloquent. And she was called Balira. She was restrained and self-denying. She didn't think of herself first. She wasn't excessive in her food or drink. And for this they called her Zahida. She was devoted to Allah in worship. Even in the most difficult moments at Karbala, she was Abida. And I'd say in modern times, as we're using these words today, we would call her a doer. In our terms we say a doer. Someone who didn't sit back. Someone who didn't wait for things to happen. She wasn't someone who allowed tragedies to knock her down and deplete her of her courage and energy. She was a doer. And remember, when the women were scattered after the battle, she was the one to gather them up and to take care of them and to look for those who had been lost. When there were injuries from the fires and the fighting, don't forget, we don't remember that sometimes in our... And our Majesty says, we don't remember that people were burned, they were injured people, there were people to nurse and take care of. And she was the one who came forward and took care of those who were injured. And in Iran, they celebrate Nurses' Day in her honor for the nursing that she did. 
And when no one was left to confront the injustices, she confronted them and spoke the hard and bitter truth, even though it was not the norm at that time for a woman to come out in that manner, for, for the family of the actual they to reveal themselves in this way. So it was extremely powerful and poignant that she did so. Now I want to share a word with you. She was not one who was Baalessa. This is a root word for Iblis. This word means a person of desperate character, someone who is struck dumb with despair, someone who's broken in spirit or perplexed and unable to see the way. She was not silent on account of grief. Most of us, I'm sure, facing this type of physical trauma, tragedy, loss, where everyone you count on is gone moment after moment, would certainly go into shock and be struck dumb with despair, but she was not. So remember, whenever you're facing any challenges in your life, no matter what they are, they are trivial, trivial, trivial compared to what she did. And if she can have this fortitude facing these tragedies and these challenges, certainly we can too. Certainly we can too. So the next time you're frustrated by whatever injustice, small or large, that you face, bring her image to mind. Bring her to the front and think how she persevered and didn't allow herself to become despair, full of despair, or struck dumb with grief. That is not a state of a believer in Allah. This is almost a sin, it's a gana, because you are losing hope in Allah. Never despair, never despair. Have a good sleep, wake up, get up, and try again. Don't allow yourself to be defeated. Even if you have your worst day, even if you're not yourself one day, even if you make mistakes that you're surprised at yourself for making, don't let it get you down because that is the work of shaitan and iblis. That's not who you are. So let it go. She had such a strong and fervent devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep that in mind. Now not only did she confront Yazid directly, but remember she spoke openly and directly to the Kufans. And she chastised them for their disloyalty and their abandonment of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Now I want to put that into perspective as well. Today in our day and age, the power of the spoken word is nowhere near as meaningful or as powerful as it was at their time. It was a verbal society. People had less distractions. People were significantly more able to pay attention than today. So when you think about the speech she gave, the weight of it is even greater than you can imagine right now, so keep that in mind. People had far less distractions and far greater attention spans. So her words were more commanding and potent than maybe your, what you hear today in our seminars and our lectures. It meant a lot more. Now remember too that she was the one who began the first majlises to mourn the tragedies of Kyavala with open lamentation and eloquent remembrance of of the tragedy. And this happened immediately after her captivity in Damascus. Again, the Grammy quotes, uh, this is a quote from his book, the strength of her submission was divine, yet her lamentation poignantly human. I think it's very important for us to always remember this element. Her strength was magnificent, yet the suffering she felt was no less than the suffering we might feel too, and the loss we might feel too. She was sad, she was heartbroken, just as any human would be. So keep that in mind so you can make a real relationship with her, one that is based on a real human being, someone that you can understand and gain from her strength and her experience and her personality. Now I want to read to you from her speech in English, of course, when she makes a challenge to Yazid because there's a particular point in this speech that I want to focus on that I think is particularly important for the youth that I have seen in my experiences and my work and for the general trend in society today. And I think this is an area, when I get to it, that is, is a downfall of our modern times. Perhaps it was an issue in the past as well, but I feel it's something that we see quite poignantly at this time. She said to Yazid, Oh Yazid, do you believe that you have succeeded in closing the sky and the earth for us and that we have become your captives just because we have been brought before you in a row and that you have secured control over us? Do you believe that we have been afflicted with insult and dishonor by Allah and that you have been given honor? 
and respect by him? You have become boastful of this apparent victory that you have secured, and you have started feeling jubilant and proud over this prestige and honor. You think that you have achieved worldly good, that your affairs have become stabilized, and our rule has fallen into your hands. Wait for a while. Do not be so joyful. Have you forgotten a love saying? The unbelievers should not carry the impression that the time allowed to them by us is good for them. Surely we give them time so that they may increase their evil deeds, and eventually they will be given insulting chastisement. This is the, from Surah number 3, Ayah number 178 in the Holy Quran. The message here is clear. What you see is not the final reality, nor is it the truth. One thing I see in the youth today is an inability to perceive that wrongdoing unaccompanied by a sign from heaven, that it is wrong, falsely assuages people's fears, hijabah, or when you made a date with that girl at school, doesn't mean that you haven't committed a sin and that there will be consequences. I have heard it and I have seen people say this because they didn't experience some immediate sign. Their faith about what they were doing diminished. Or their fear of the sin they were committing dissipated. This is false thinking and I think it's a sign of our times because it's a materialistic point of view. I don't see it, I don't feel it, I don't hear it, I don't know it. Oh, it must be okay. No. Because as Muslims, your foundational belief in the fight the unseen is absolutely critical. Your faith firmly rests on this belief. First, you have to remember, if your fitra doesn't activate by giving you a strong feeling of fear in your heart or in the pit of your stomach when you're in the middle of doing something that may not be right, may be a sin, then you need to activate your thinking capacities, which is what Sayyid Bahar al was referring to beautifully in his talk this morning. You have to activate those thinking capacities to get you through the challenges or the decisions you are making to decide whether this is right or wrong. You must remind yourself to perceive the unseen consequences yourself. This requires responsibility. This requires the power of thinking and imagining. So this is your work. It's not Allah's work to come and smack you on the head. Ah, stop. When your parents stop training you in that way, you are independently responsible. And in this way, you are independently responsible towards Allah as well. So keep that in mind. You must be actively conscious of your need. So when I, when I hear this speech, of Zainab that I read for you, and I hope when you hear it too, that this process will kick in for you, so that you are truly reflecting and absorbing her message, and it will help you in the challenges you face. Because for sure she is our example of fortitude in faith, and belief in the unseen. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, this is the book in its guidance sure, without doubt to those who fear Allah, who believe in the unseen are steadfast in prayer and spend out of what we have provided for them. Your task as Muslims is to maintain a faith and a belief in a, rela in a reality that you cannot see in the material world. The ghayb, the unseen, is foundational and you should activate it. But as I said, it is not popular in the Western world to have this point of view. And it's certainly not uh, a common point of view in a very media-driven, stimulated, Stimulation overdrive society that we live in, where there's constant information and pictures are changing constantly. We are used to and primed for that in our world, and you must get yourself unused to that. You must come on a or go on a diet of media uh, free life so that you can really build your inner world and your inner capacities for thinking, for imagining, for seeing, for having faith, for bringing the reality of these stories to your mind and to your heart and present in your life right before you. It's a capacity that is actually diminishing at a rapid, rapid pace. 
In my work in education, I can tell you this is one of the biggest challenges that students face in the world today, is this overstimulation of media and, believe it or not, a hyperdrive towards intellectual development at a premature age. Another topic for another time. Something that is not always a welcome discussion, but very important. That's affecting people's capacities to imagine, to see, to be able to absorb concepts that are greater and beyond the physical reality. And then I want to, in closing, quote from another article that it was in the USA Today, I think it was in 2008, and the title of this article was called, uh, Is Religion the Millen uh, Losing Ground in the Millennial Generation? It was written by a religious, uh, a religion professor, Stephen Prothero, and he discusses his students' lack of interest in religion that has consequences and dogma. So in other words, his students were not interested in religions that had consequences and dogma. Dogma meaning rules, which again were mentioned in your lecture. Guidelines to help you know what to do and when to do it and where. People are not interested in being told what to do. It's offensive. Well, it's not because Allah created you and he has the right. But what he was seeing in his students, because he gave them an assignment. The assignment was Create your own religion. Come up with your own tenets. See what you come up with. And what he found, I can't quite imagine why you would do that, but he did that. And he found that they would come up with religions that had easy paths, where anything goes, where there was no discipline, and therefore there was little effort necessary. There was no deity and no consequences. No hereafter and no salvation. Instead, the goal of each of these religions that were made up by the students were happiness, and they want it now. One student, however, probably the bright one in the class, critiqued her classmates, and she noted that these religions that they made up were nothing more than organized atheism. They took normal human impulses, such as eating, drinking, sleeping, socializing, and justified them under the title of religion while not offering any form of explanation into why we are here, where we came from, or where we go when we die. Let me give you an experience of two churches in my area. One is a traditional Catholic church that we went to visit to hear the Latin Mass. And this is the traditional uh, Catholic Mass that is no longer practiced by the majority of Catholics. This is pre-Vatican II uh, service or Mass. I met a woman who was lovely. I said to her, why do you like coming here? And why do you choose this over another church? She said, because this requires work. And I believe in order to achieve in the spiritual domain, you have to work. So in this Mass, you, the, the participants of the Mass are kneeling for a, almost the majority of the session uh, of the Mass. Kneeling, penitent. It's a humble position. It requires sincere devotion. Whereas today, that's a limited part of the service in the, in the more contemporary Mass. Now let's contrast that with the church down the street uh, from my home, where it's a new church, it's called The Vine. And when they started to put up their um, posters and inviting people to come join the church, the first thing they were having was a pumpkin patch. Come and join us, do pumpkin carving. And then they had a sing-along. And now, in this warmer weather, oh, what are they gonna have? Noah's carnival, water carnival. Noah's Ark Water Carnival. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Would you like to go to Noah's Ark Water Carnival? What a belittling of the most major event in history where Allah punishes the entire world and eliminates the wrongdoers and sinners. Now we're going to make it into a water carnival. So what you see in this church is a diminishing of the importance of religion and doctrines and dogma and challenges and reducing it to fun and entertainment, and let's have fun, and let's carve pumpkins, and let's have a water park. But that's not religion. But they're trying to draw people with this appeal towards entertainment. But that's not who we are. We're not here to entertain you. We are here to guide ourselves towards Allah, and to become closer to Allah, inshallah, and to have the fortitude and dignity that Zainab alayhi salam demonstrated for us. So again, remember, she is not only the example for the sisters, she's the example for the brothers because she had beloved sons who she was devoted to and whom she sacrificed. She had a beloved brother who she devoted and sacrificed for as well. 
and was heartbroken at his loss in a way that we will never understand. But always keep her in your four, the four in your forethought, in your mind, when you face whatever challenges you have in your life, no matter how serious they are, and people can face unbelievable challenges. So as I close my lecture this, after, this morning, rather, I would ask you also for Surah Fatiha because there is a member in your local community who recently had a great tragedy, lost his wife and his expected child in one go. And it is a tremendous blow to this individual who was very devoted and looking forward to this child to be born, who was anticipated after many, many years of not having children. It is a great tragedy. Please, in honor of Zainab alayhi salam, please make a surah fatiha for this family. And after that, I will say my salam alaykum to you. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful, I dedicate every effort I've made here for you this morning um, to our Ahlul Bayt. And I also dedicate it to this um, gentleman in your community that may Allah may give him fortitude and strength in the manner of Zainab alayhi salam. Assalamu alaikum to all of you and thank you.